All right, you guys, we're going to open in prayer. And uh, just a couple of things. Continue to uh, lift, pray for our brother Oscar. He was in vacation and got sick. And uh, it's COVID, so anybody want to come breathe on him? <laughs> also, uh, our brother Henry has a meeting today at 9, which is a pretty significant meeting for one of the ministries that we're having here at the church. But more than that, for the opportunity for men's lives to come to Christ. So continue to lift Henry up as he has this meeting at 9 a.m. And then uh, uh, one of our brothers... Uh, Ken Hilliard brought this prayer request to me and it's a uh, it's a friend Michael who's dying from cancer and he's heavily medicated and in and out of sleep so he's on hospice and Ken was going to go see him um, but may not be able to so lift this gentleman named Michael up and then uh, his, Ken's grandson is learning how to drive and it says to pray for his nerves and safety <laughs> I got nervous thinking about that Ken <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why don't we pray you guys father we thank you so much for this time that we were able to gather here this morning and lord uh i pray for uh, we lift up oscar before you lord i pray that you would bring healing to him touch his body lord we lift up henry as he has this meeting this morning lord that your favor with the people they're interviewing with lord that they would see the value in and uh, in what Henry and, and the others are doing, Lord, and, and may this prayer be answered in, our, in, in his favor, in our favor, Lord. Lord, we lift up uh, Michael, this um, gentleman that's mentioned, Lord, is he's going in and out of sleep. We pray that, first of all, he may know who you are. And Lord, for uh, Ken's grandson as he's learning to drive, uh, that you would calm Ken's nerves and, uh, and the safety, Lord. And Lord, for my brother Ray, he, uh, as an unspoken request that we talked about this morning, I lift him up before you. So Lord, thank you for these men that are here. And uh, Lord, may your hand be upon our study in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I want to welcome the guys who are joining us online and uh, welcome you guys that are here this morning. Uh, so just to see that 709, we've got some 709 guys here, right? Yeah? Yay. They got me the sweatshirt. The only reason why I'm saying is I'm taking orders. I wear 2X. <laughs> and if you guys want to talk 709, Ray's uh, already getting a Teamsters one, so I'll be rocking that one as well. <laughs> so uh, this morning we're in 2 Kings chapter 16, and we're going to break 2 Kings chapter 16 up into three different studies. Because what I, I see that the writer's doing here is he's showing us how our acts can we respond to God's judgment, which will respond to false worship. And this, this new king that we're going to be introduced to is I want to take the, the, a few moments this morning to build on the foundation of how he thought he was worshiping the Lord. And it all begins within the heart. And this is where the Bible is clear about our hearts are being wicked, desperately wicked, evil above all things. I'm paraphrasing that. Our hearts. This king that we're going to be introduced to has a heart that is so wicked that he does one of the most deplorable things a king can ever do. What's even more interesting is that this king is the king of Judah. So we're going to get into, we're going to look at these first four verses today. And the title of this message is A King Gone Bad. So, Lord, be with us as we open your word. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Second mm -hmm. Kings chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God and his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places on the hills under every green tree. 
So in chapter 16, we're going to break this up into three different studies. First, we're going to look at the acts and the characteristics of this king. Next week, we'll take a look at how the results of these acts that he's doing now, how that results in God's judgment. And then after that, which will lead to a heart of false worship. So, you know, sometimes, guys, as we are doing our own things and we think we're walking in the ways of the Lord, who in reality, we're walking in the ways of the world. Sometimes we, could, we feel that we're walking with one foot in and one foot out. If we don't have both feet in walking with the Lord, we're not walking with the Lord. And a lot of times we can fool ourselves thinking that, hey, I can still follow the Lord, but get away with this. And ultimately, that will lead to God's judgment. When we receive God's judgment, a lot of times that will lead into a heart that is continuing to have false worship. And it all begins in the heart. So we see that these acts and the results of these acts and false worship are indicators of a heart as it does not worship the Lord. So when we look at, when we've looked at chapter 15, last we've been looking at chapter 15 for the last couple of weeks, and we have looked at eight different kings. And the kings were from Azariah, king of Judah, the other kings were the kings of Israel. We looked at Zechariah and Shalom and Menahem and Pekahiah and Pekah. These are the kings of Israel. And, the, and the, the crazy thing about these kings is that they were assassinating each other. But there's one common theme among, among these six kings of Israel. They were all involved in idolatry. Every single one of these kings in, nor, in the north, the kings of Israel, we're all involved with idol worshiping. And we looked at that last week, men, as what are the things that we've allowed in our lives that can be, cons can be considered idols? Well, what's the thing that you're thinking about most this morning? As most of you are know are thinking about me, I, I understand that. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? About? But what's the thing that you're thinking about this morning the most? The thing that has you worried? The thing that has you concerned? We can almost say that that may have become an idol in your life because it's taken your time away from the Lord. And each of these kings here are kings that have introduced idolatry. Now, five of the kings, I'm sorry, five of the kings of Israel, three kings of Judah, only two kings were from the kingdom of Judah. Only two kings. It was Azariah, Uzziah, and Jotham. But both did not take away high places of worship. You know, we can be considered men of God. We can walk in the ways of the Lord. But if we have high places in our hearts that are lifted up against the Lord, it's just a matter of time before those high places in our lives will begin to outshine the worship of the Lord. And we have to be careful that all of these kings here that are, in, that, are, that are in Judah. Now remember, the kingdom of Israel has been divided into two, kingdom, two kingdoms, the north and the south. The king that Israel is considered the north. Judah is the south. All the kings of the north, all the kings of Israel were wicked. King Ahab, King Jeroboam, King Joram. All these kings were introduced idol worshiping, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But we look at the kings of Judah. Now, if you can remember with me, who was the first king of Judah? You guys better come to church on Sunday. <laughs> Saul was the king of Israel. Right? Who? Saul. David. Right, Josh? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I better come to church on Sunday. <laughs> David was the king of Judah. Who came from the tribe of Judah? You guys better come to church for sure. On Sunday. We actually have church tomorrow night too. Jesus. Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. David comes from the, the, the is the king of Judah. And we're going to see this here in a few moments. But it's 
Amazing that through these kings, even these kings in the south where Jesus is going to come from that lineage of Judah, fell into idolatry. And that's a good reminder for us men that even though we are men of God, we have to guard our hearts against idolatry. And it, idolatry is so subtle today. I see that uh, Velo's walking around in his golden cabs right now. <laughs> in the name of the Lakers, right? Amen. But they're up three to one. Amen. <laughs> but and I'm, I'm just teasing you, Velo. But oftentimes, the idolatry in our lives can be so subtle. And it begins to take our focuses off our marriages, off our children, off more importantly than the Lord. And what's amazing is that these kings that are from the south were kings that were considered good kings. So we know that all the kings of Israel are considered wicked. They're considered evil. And now in chapter 16, we're going to be introduced to a king named Ahaz, who's the king of Judah, who was briefly introduced to us in chapter 15, verse 38. All you have to do is look one verse back, and it tells us that Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. So we're not, not too much in chapter 15 is mentioned in Ahaz, but the introduction to verse 1 of chapter 16 gives us more detailed about the most wicked king of Judah. Now, why is he so wicked? Well, first of all, when we read here in verse 1, we see that the writer is giving his typical introduction of a king. Remember with me that the writer will always introduce the opposing king. In this here, since we're looking at a new king of Judah, the writer is going to uh, compare the reign of this new king of Judah compared to the reign of the king that's currently reigning in Israel. This is why it says in verse 1 of chapter 16, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, reigned in his place. So we see that Pekah is currently the king in the north. Now we know that Pekah was, assass uh, was, was assassinated, but during his reign in Israel, this man named Ahaz came to power. And it tells us here that he began his reign. And in verse 2, it tells us that he was 25 years old. So he's a young king. So what does that tell us? That tells us that at that time, they had what are called co-regencies. Jotham, his father, more than likely was co-reigning with Ahaz because he's such a young man. And we see that he reigned for 16 years in the kingdom of Judah. Now what's interesting here in verse 2, it says, And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. But look at the subtle difference the writer is using here in verse 2 that has never been used before when introducing the king of Judah. Do you see the pronoun before Lord? It says, or it says, in the sight of the Lord, what? His God. Interesting. Because of all the writing that this writer has done with all the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, never has he mentioned his God. Even when referencing the other kings of Judah, he never references the Lord, his God. And I find that interesting because we see here that there is a relationship that is supposed to be going on with the kings of the south with God. Now what the writer is doing here, he's making a, taking a jab at King Ahaz because what he's saying here, I'm jumping way ahead of myself, uh, we see here that every king up to this point from Judah has done right in the eyes of the Lord. But never has the writer introduced his God. But why is that? Because we see here, uh, what the writer's wanting to do here is he's setting up how despicable this king is. So it'd be like, I'm going to use, I use Marcos for a moment here. 
It would be like saying Marcos is a car thief and he reigned as a car thief for, are you still doing car thieves? <laughs> <clears throat> and he's being introduced as the one who did evil in the sight of the Lord, his God. Because he's claiming to be a Christian, but yet he's doing evil things. The writer here is saying, look, this guy is from the kingdom of Judah that comes from the lineage of David. And ultimately, our Messiah comes from the tribe of Judah. And so therefore, the kings of Judah had this covenant that was given to David by God in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Let me read it with you, and I think it'll be on the screen here. This is a promise that God has made to David and his dynasty that comes from the kingdom of Judah. So look what he says here in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul whom I removed before you and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. You, before you, your throne shall be established forever. That was for David and for the kingdom of Judah. Now notice in 2 Samuel here, the words that the prophet is using here is he's using his. You notice that? When you look back at that verse, he shall build a house for my name and I'll establish his kingdom and I will be his father. See what the writer's doing here is he's using that same language of the covenant that has been made by God to the kingdom of Judah. So what the writer is telling us here that this king who's in the Davidic dynasty is committing this deplorable act a kingdom where God has said, I will establish your kingdom forever. If you walk in my ways and walk in my statutes, I will establish your kingdom. If his is this and his is that, and the writer is taking words from this promise and inserting it when he says he did evil in the sight of the Lord of his God. There's supposed to be this relationship between God and the kings of Judah. And the writer is subtly setting us up to see the deplorable acts that this king is going to do. Because of this promise from God to King David, the king of Judah was a man that belonged to God and the people belonged to God and God belonged to them. That's what this promise told us in 2 Samuel. But what makes this king Ahaz so deplorable and despicable that he was a, God, a king that belonged to God and God belonged to him because of this very promise. And I started thinking about us in our own lives, men, that God has given us promises in our lives. Promises that tell us that we are his children. We are his men. We are his people. And oftentimes, we will continue to live lives as if we have no covenant with the Lord. And God is telling him here that, Look, my kingdom is going to be established forever. Well, the Bible tells us that we're priests, men. And oftentimes we carry this priesthood so loosely around us that we take it off to anything that's been offered us to by this world. Just think of the lust that we as men go through on a daily basis. Some of us men happen to just fall to it all the time. What about the drugs and the drinking and the whatever. And we have to remember that God has given us covenants to be his people, to be his men, to walk in his ways, to walk worthy of the Lord. And oftentimes we are stumbled because we don't grab a hold of how God loves us. And oftentimes we forget that we are his because we will live life as I am mine. 
And this king here does such a deplorable act that he, the, it's interesting that the writer is saying, look, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, of the Lord, his God. But look what he's doing. Look what verse three says. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Now, walking in the way of the kings of Israel, what does that mean, you guys? What are the kings of Israel known for? Idolatry. So this king of Judah, who has this covenant promised to them in 2 Samuel chapter 7, is now being identified as a king that walks in the ways of the kings of Israel. Now, don't tell me that's not a slap in the face. Because the kings of Israel were known for idolatry. They introduced Baal. They introduced Molech. They introduced Chemosh. In Spanish, you say Chemosh. Now, where you get cheese muscles from? I'm just teasing. <laughs> but you see that it was Jezebel who married Ahab that brought in the worship of Baal. Astereth, the sex goddess. Baal, the storm god, the Canaanite god. Molech. Molech was the god that the Canaanites would worship and they would believe in worshiping their children. So what they would do is Molech would have his arms out there stretched out and they would heat his arms up so their arms turned a white color because it was bronze and they would lay their babies on there to sacrifice them. How horrible. Just thinking of the sounds and the smell and all of these things that uh, this, this sacrifice and this act of worship is for this God. And this is what Ahaz has been doing because it says here in verse three, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Now look what it does here. This, I'm gonna break this verse up into two parts here. In 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 28, we can use a backdrop that I'll reference here in a few moments. But the first thing to his downfall was he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Now walking. I mean, we do that every day. We count our steps, right? We walk. It takes us places. But when you use the walk in Christian circles, it really usually describes our relationship with the Lord. Ephesians tells us to walk in love, to walk worthy, to walk circumspectly. And we use this word to describe, bro, how's your walk with the Lord? How's your walk with, and, and we can use that to reference our relationship with God. But oftentimes, our walk will also connect us in what we do. When we consider our daily walk, a lot of us think of our Christianity. A lot of us will think, well, what I do for work? Or how are you walking? That could mean that we're, how are we doing in life? What's your relationship like with Christ? And oftentimes, we can be referenced as his walk with the Lord is great. His walk with the Lord is, mm, I can see some fruit in this. This man, his walk is compared to the kings of Israel. Now, how would you like to be compared to Ahab? I mean, I know some of you guys made it to Jezebel, but... <laughs> Dave Barrios, edit that out, please. <laughs> but you see right away his character, his way of life, his identity is compared to the walk of the king of Israel. How is your walk compared to? What is your walk compared to, men? Is it compared to Jesus Christ? Or is it compared to the world? This convicts me because... I need to be able to walk where I'm not identified with kings that are into idolatry. But I'm identified as a man seeking to be set apart for the Lord. Do I fall short every single day? But our goal and our aim as men is to be set apart for Jesus Christ. Not to be identified with the world. Not to be identified as an idolater. Not to be identified as easily falling for things because we have made lifted up high places in our hearts. 
So we know that these kings are, are all about idolatry. All 19 kings of the north of Israel worshiped idols. You can look at that from 1 Kings chapter 14 all the way to 2 Kings chapter 17. King after king after king in the northern kingdom all worshiped idols. But now we have this man who is the king of Judah walking in the ways of the kings of Israel. And look what it says in the second part of verse 3. Indeed. What does that word indeed mean? For sure. He walked, not only did he walk in the ways of the kings of Israel, but the writers tell him, I'm going to show you something so deplorable about his heart and his character. Look what it says here. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire. Now, it wasn't like when we're kids camping at in a campground and we run through the campfire. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. Right? You just kind of jolt through it real quick and see if you get burned. No, it, it's not that he passed through it. He was sacrificed and laid upon. Here it tells us his son. Second Chronicles says his children. What does that mean? It means that other kids were being offered as a sacrifice. Now, this is more likely to the to the god Molech. And we see here that is, this is simply a severe condemnation on this guy. Because scripture is clear about this type of worship. But from the time that Jeroboam became king, Israel has suffered one bad king after another. And so we see that he had his son pass through the fire. So as I mentioned, they get this statue, it wasn't very high, and it, <clears throat> I should have brought a picture of it. I was going to get a picture and I was going to dub someone's face in it from our men's ministry. <laughs> I think it was going to be Carlos in her, in her greater gear. <laughs> Much love to you, Carlos. <laughs> no, but it was a statue, in, in it, and it was obviously a, a pagan god. And sometimes Moloch would have the face of uh, like a horse or uh, almost like one of the Egyptian gods, and he would be in strong in stature, and he would have his arms out. And usually it was bronze, and they would heat these arms up till they turned like a white color of how hot it was, and they would lay the babies on there. And this was an act of worship. And what's so deplorable about this is if you put yourself there, and we've mentioned this, think about the sounds that you would hear. The crying and the screaming and, and the mothers crying and, 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 and they're worshiping. You know, when we come to church, we worship, right? Some worship in many different styles. We, some people lift their arms up. Some people have their arms here like they're carrying a microwave. Some have their arms lifted. It's just different styles of worship. But our, our adoration is towards the Lord when we worship. It's an act of love towards the Lord. So this king is saying, I'm willing to give up my son in the most horrible way. And they would be burned to death. It wasn't an instantaneous thing. It was a, a process that they would burn them, their skin would begin to blister, it would peel. They weren't on fire, they were just burning to death. Think about that for a moment, moment, guys. The smell of burnt flesh, the cries of the baby, and the king worshiping Molech. Some commentators were saying that he was kneeling down as skin was dripping like water off the arms and hitting the ground, thinking that he was making a sacrifice, a worship to a God. See, men, the danger of worshiping other things, where we become so involved with it, we literally will sacrifice our children, we will sacrifice our wives, and we will sacrifice our family in pursuit of of the idols we have set in our lives. 
They might not, their skin may not be boiling and dripping like water. And hear their cries. But maybe we're sacrificing them the same way as an act of worship to the idols that we have may have set up in our lives. See, men, we have the amazing responsibility to all of us fathers here to lead our children in the true worship of the Lord. But oftentimes we can kneel down to the very things that we're worshiping and our children are the ones that suffer. So this whole deplorable act was an act of worship. He made the most unholiest sacrifice of all. Although we don't know how widespread these practices were going on at that time, we know that the Canaanites sacrificed their children to Molech and other gods. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, it says, And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord. I am the Lord. Jeremiah 32, 25 says, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their children, their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech. I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. This is Judah that we're talking about. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 to 11 says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or anyone who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or those who conjures up spells, or medium, or spiritualist, or one who calls up the dead. So we see that this act of worship all began because he did not do right in the sight of the Lord. See, men, when we are in that place where we're not doing right in the eyes of the Lord, it will ultimately lead us to sacrificing to what we worship. And we have to be very careful that we do not allow these things to come up in our lives because we will worship it. And oftentimes, my friends, it is our wives and our children. If I'm 100% honest with you guys, I've often put my children on the arms of Molech. And as a father, they weren't burning because of, they weren't crying because of their burning. They were crying because I was unavailable. My wife. And oftentimes in pursuit of ministry, I can oftentimes turn my worship for ministry into <clears throat> worshiping Molech. Please don't think I'm saying that serving the God is like serving Molech. No, what I'm saying is that being here became an idol in my life. And my kids missing me and, cry and, and crying. My wife spending all the time with the kids by herself. I begin to worship being here. I begin to worship other things. And oftentimes it was my children that were crying. See, man, we got one shot at this. We got one shot at making a difference in our children's lives. And maybe our children are grown. We have a shot at our grandchildren. We have one shot with our wives. We have one shot in being men of God. We're not to let anything be lifted up before us. In 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 3 and 4, it says, referring to the same account that we're talking about, Ahaz burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, just exactly what it says in Jeremiah, and burned his children in the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and every green tree. We see a process here. The first step 
to Ahaz's downward fall is that he forsook the worship of the true living God. He began to worship the gods of the pagans. And even that step would have seemed to be happened gradually. At first he began not taking away the high places. Then he allowed graven images and other pagan customs to come in to be used as worship instead of God. And finally, the idols of the false gods were set up. And then this procedure of compromise had now reached a high and fitting conclusion. And listen to this here. When the right makes compromise with the wrong, the wrong is sure to gain victory. And so this is the case. The people became accustomed to the high places and they saw no harm in them. And now they see no harm in worshiping idols. And ultimately they see no harm in burning children. See that progression? How that suddenly begins to work? We can get so used to our sin that we can begin to patronize it or to make excuses for it, say, well, I was born this way. Or you know what, I didn't have this and I didn't have that and it's part of my culture. So therefore, because my dad did it and my grandfather did it, it's okay for me to do it. It's just, it's just something the family goes through. And what happens is we become, to get, we become getting used to it. And then we begin getting used to it and it becomes so common that it's not even second, a second thought. And then it, then it, it leads to more worshiping of idols. And the next thing we're doing, we're sacrificing our children. It's very subtle. Man. And we have to be careful because they become so accustomed to it that it was even deplorable to them anymore. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter two, verse eight, describes this corruption. It says, their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. God did intend for us men to fall in things like this. Just like he didn't intend the Jewish young boys to go through the fire of Molech. This is what scripture tells us about the children of the Jewish nation. In Numbers chapter 18 verses 14 through 16, this is what it says. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Everything that first opens the wounds of all flesh, the womb of all flesh, which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem, and those redeem of devoted things you shall redeem when one month old, according to your valuation, for five shekels of silver, according to the shekels of the sanctuary, which is 20 giras. What's this saying? That the, the, the children, the firstborn male of Israel, was to be redeemed, never sacrificed. Same with us, men. We're never to be given over to sacrifice of false worship. We're never to be sacrificed in anything. We're redeemed by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. We've been bought at a price. But oftentimes, men, we can fall into these things that's just been going on forever in my life. So therefore, I'm just making excuses for it. When in reality, we're sacrificing those loved ones around in our lives. How can a son who belonged to God be sacrificed to an idol? When I wrote that, I was asking myself the same thing. John, how could you belong to God and still sacrifice your children to an idol? But Ahab was a compromiser, both in his religious practices and in his spiritual leadership. And what a worship it was to substitute for the worship of the only true and living almighty God. See, this is useless worship. To worship the work of their own hands, it brought them no help when they, went, they came in their hour of distress. It was a foul, degrading worship described in the, in the third verse as the abomination of nations. We can have a faint idea of this despicable practices associated with the 
uh, practice worship of pagan gods, the worship of Molech. We should not think of our child sacrifice as a pagan practice that belongs only to the distant past. When we think about abortion, it's the leading child sacrifice that we have today more than ever. According to the American Center for Law and, and Justice, on an average, and this is not a report, this is for those that are not reported, on an average, 1,500 to 2,500 children are aborted every day in the United States, and that number is going up. When I was looking on the website, it was showing the year to date, and I was looking, and it was just a calendar just ticking up. We think this is deplorable. What about Planned Parenthood today? Planned Parenthood and another abortion clinics have become the high places of the postmodern world. So the logic today is really the same logic they had back in that time. I want my life to be happy as possible and I'm willing to sacrifice someone else to make sure I get happiness that I, that I think I deserve. Next week, men, we're going to look at how this affected Ahaz when we look at the judgment of God on this. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this sobering reminder, Lord, of the dangers of idol worshiping, the dangers of sacrificing our children, our wives, our families, when we begin to lift those high places up in our lives, Lord, we begin to sacrifice our own children. Today, this morning, Lord, I want to think about those mamas who are thinking about going today or maybe have an appointment today with Planned Parenthood. And they're about to pass their children through the fire of Molech. We lift them up and for your divine intervention that you would speak to their hearts because there may be an evangelist there, a pastor, a worship leader, women of God. And Lord, we've allowed even this Planned Parenthood become just a daily part of our lives <clears throat> as we, our hearts can become used to it. The cries of the babies. Lord, may we guard our hearts against any high thing that we've lifted up against you where we've also sacrificed our children. May we keep our eyes focused and centered on you. And may you always be glorified. Fill these men with your spirit today that we may be, make a stand for your word and a stand for you, Jesus. Thank you for the guys that are here today, Lord. Thank you for the guys that are watching online. And now, Lord, bless our breakfast. May you be glorified and honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, thank you. Thank you guys for tuning in.